Hey guys, Allie Dameron here. Today we're gonna talk about the nervous system. And I know if you're thinking, oh my God, I, that sounds boring, I don't care. This is definitely something that we all need to be thinking about. A hypersensitive nervous system can cause a lot of symptoms, including feeling low energy, mood swings, insomnia, chronic pain, period issues, etc. And there are things that women come to me for on a daily basis. And this is probably one of the biggest conversations I have with my patients. So stay tuned to learn how to calm down your nervous system, especially if you're feeling constantly on edge, irritable mood swings, like you're constantly in that fight or flight response. This video is definitely for you. If you haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button to be notified anytime I post new content related to women's health hormones or holistic health. So I talked about this a few weeks ago when I was talking about how I healed from adrenal fatigue and what this looked like. It's gonna make a lot more sense if we sort of like look at these two together. So that one's a good one to start with. But if you don't want to, that's fine too. Hypervigilance in a nervous system basically means that situations or stimuli or events in life that should not be considered dangerous start to feel dangerous to you. So there's all kinds of examples of this, like phobias, fear of flying, fear of social events or situations, fear of different people, fear of food, any of those things. There's a lot of examples of this that you can probably think about either yourself or other people that have, but it goes deeper than that. So you might think like fear of flying. It's a safe thing. We know that it's been tested over and over and over. There's hardly any plane accidents, all of those things, but all of knowing all of that, a lot of people, including myself, are afraid to fly. It doesn't prevent me from flying. I just kind of suck it up and do it. But my nervous system is definitely very on edge every time I'm on an airplane. And the thing is, it didn't always used to be that way. And I didn't really ever have an event necessarily that triggered that for me after all of the years that I did fly. But one day, my nervous system got the message, Flying is scary, and so every time I'm on a plane and we hit a bump, my nervous system goes up, I go into that fight or flight response, my heart starts beating fast, I get kind of hot and clammy, and my mind starts to race. And you might feel like you have these experiences in different areas that you can specifically think about, or you may just feel like this on a regular basis. I know a lot of women and moms out there feel just hurry up and get going and yelling and ragey and irritable and mood swings and fatigued and all of the things on a pretty daily basis, even just like when relating to their families. And I think a lot of us feel a lot of shame about that and guilt that we are that way. I have a lot of women come to me that want to change that, which is kudos to you and I get it. I was like that at a point in my own parenting journey too. Um, and that is the root of that is a nervous system that's hypervigilant. So I want to give you an example of this. This system of our brain was created if you are in a really catastrophic situation like a car accident, a burning building, being chased by a wild animal, etc. So what happens is your brain sort of is like a smoke alarm and a smoke alarm just goes off, right? It doesn't care that you burnt toast and the situation's a thousand percent under control, it's fine. Or if your house is on fire, it's going off if it detects any little bit of smoke or anything that could emulate a fire. And so it happens so automatically that it doesn't have time to think, hmm, I guess she just burnt the toast. There's a little bit of smoke. I think she's here. I think she's pouring water on it. I think it's okay. The windows are open. We're ventilating the situation. I think we actually have it under control, right? It just goes off. And then it's sort of like you pick up the pieces afterwards where you're like, okay, it went off. Now let's you know, turn it off, we have the situation under control, or it went off and it needed to go off. Thank God it went off, we alerted us of a fire, we were able to act and get ourselves safely out of the house. So that's truly what your nervous system is like. It happens so automatically that it doesn't have time to really think about the situation. So what happens is over time, those of us with a super hypervigilant nervous system start detecting normal, safe things as dangers more and more and more. So the more you buy into this hypervigilance of your nervous system, the worse it's going to be long-term. So for example, when I was afraid to fly, for example, and I let myself kind of do that, my nervous system went off and I was like, oh my God, I'm scared now to fly. And I started buying into the catastrophic thoughts instead of saying like, nope, we're not doing this, we're fine, not a big deal, kind of calming it down. 
it got worse for me before it got better. I am still in the process, I'm not going to lie, of helping myself through that. And there's a lot of strategies that I've worked through and it's much, much better than it was. But we definitely learn how to be scared of these things. So the good news here is due to this idea called neuroplasticity, the same way that we learned how to be scared of things, like maybe you learn to be scared of a snake. A snake by nature is a fairly like neutral thing. Like, yes, there's venomous ones and things that we should definitely avoid and, and get out of the way of, of course but like a bull snake or something like that is not something to be scared of. I also am terrified of snakes. And so at some point in my life, I learned to be terrified. My family growing up was terrified. And so I learned that those are super scary. I have friends who go in their yard and pick up the snake and like throw it out of the way or they just leave it there. And so their brains obviously did not get the message that that was something to be scared of. So you can see this idea of like neuroplasticity. Some people are scared of some things, some people are triggered by other things, and we're all a little bit different in that way. So that's a learned response. Contrary, if you think about, I'm gonna give you a different example of neuroplasticity, learning a foreign language. So in high school, maybe you wanted to learn Spanish and you went to Spanish class and you read it, you know, spoke it, listened to it, were immersed in it. Your brain then learned Spanish and over time, of course. It didn't happen immediately. You had to, you know, continue to wire that in there, but it eventually learned Spanish. And then maybe we graduated from high school and didn't use Spanish or the foreign language that we used for a while. And we didn't just say, stop learning it, don't think about it, we don't wanna use this anymore. If we wanted to unlearn it, we simply just stopped using it. You can't force yourself to unlearn things because what your brain focuses on is what you're going to get. So the more that we are like, don't focus on your knee, for example. If I said, don't focus on your knee, don't focus on your knee, don't focus on your knee, you're gonna focus on your knee. I know I certainly just did by sitting here, I started to notice my knee. So you can't force yourself to unlearn things or calm down. You simply just stop using them and teaching your brain that that thing is a safe thing. Hence the idea, I'm not a psychologist or a mental health professional, but hence the idea of exposure therapy, which I certainly know for myself, the more I fly, the easier it gets because I'm able to say during turbulence, okay, this is safe, we're good, this is fine. Think about some stats and facts because I'm an analytical person that I've learned and you know, sort of take it down and realize each time that I experience a bump or whatever in the air and we don't crash, that's a win for evidence. But if I don't use it for a while and I haven't flown for several months or whatever, it definitely gets harder. It definitely got harder for me after the pandemic when I had not been flying and hadn't been able to kind of exercise that part of my brain. Okay, so the good news here is that we can now, I've given you numerous examples about how you can actually unlearn this. You came in the door this one way of learning it, now we can walk straight back out the door the same way, but it's going to take a little bit of effort on your own part. We have to start to recognize why this is happening in the first place. For me, it was really, really helpful to understand why it happened. So for example, my brain at a certain point learned that flying, or if your example is you're in fight or flight getting the kids out the door in the morning, that being late is triggering to you. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more of a real life example now because flying is not something that we deal with on an everyday basis. I know a lot of moms struggle at getting their kids out the door in the morning and that tends to be a time where we're yelling and screaming and the kids are fighting back and can tend to be a fairly chaotic time. Have you noticed that I probably experienced that because I definitely do experience this too. So that is a triggering thing. And so when we pull back the curtain on that scary thing, the trigger here is being late, at least for me. For me, I'm like rushing my kids because I don't want them to be late for school or sports or I don't wanna be late for my thing. So I think that kind of pulling back that curtain and saying like, okay, so the reason that you're in a hypervigilant state and kind of like up yelling, hurrying, being chaotic, running around the house, all of those things is because you don't want to be late. So then the next step that I do is say, okay, so what would actually be the worst case scenario if I was late? So if, I, if my kids are late to school, what happens is we park, I walk them in the door, I have to sign them into school and they go on their way. Is it ideal? No. Is it catastrophic? Also no, it's not catastrophic. It is a minor inconvenience of my day. But 
by me throwing things around and yelling and screaming and hurrying them up, it's basically telling my brain that if they're late, it's this catastrophic life or death situation. So it becomes very hyper vigilant, checking the clock and thinking about it. And so each day, this automatic thing just happens easier and easier and easier. So our job is to teach ourselves, okay, I'm not gonna go into fight or flight response today. I'm going to breathe. If we're late, we're late, not a big deal. And teach your brain that even that worst case scenario that you're thinking, if it happens, it's not that big of a deal. Now I know what you're thinking. Well, mine is really catastrophic. And if it did happen, it would actually be a huge deal and it would be catastrophic. So then the next step of that is to actually think about how probable that is. And there's worksheets out there. There's a lot of therapists out there, things like that, that can help you. But I think if you start to pull open that curtain on that monster, you'll start to realize that it's either okay if it happens, probably a minor inconvenience or really not probable to actually happen. So I encourage you, instead of just staying into fight or flight and without really looking at the situation, pull open that curtain and look at it and see what is the worst case scenario here. I also want to remind you of some things that can cause this hypervigilance. So pain, um, I had this, and if you want more information on chronic pain and how this works, you can go to the website P is in Paul, P is in Paul, D association.org slash symptoms. If you're having like chronic symptoms, migraines, back pain, neck pain, IBS symptoms, dizziness, eczema, all of these different things are a part of our hypervigilant nervous system and a reaction of that. And so there's this wonderful website that is what started my journey in learning about the nervous system to begin with called ppdassociation.org. So they're an amazing group of physicians out there who treat this way and teach you about this and they are wonderful and quite frankly for millions of patients life-saving so go check that out if pain or symptoms is an issue for you other things can be social settings like people that have agoraphobia or are afraid of certain social situations flying like i mentioned chemicals foods foods can also create hypervigilance a lot of people with food sensitivities, maybe we're told that gluten can cause bloating and bloating is really, really triggering to them. And so they learned that gluten could cause that. And so the next time they ate gluten and got bloated, they created this correlation and causation. And now they think that gluten is scary because it can cause this bloating or etc. So you can learn definitely that foods are scary and your brain can wire that in so that you start to experience food sensitivities when you eat certain foods. I find that very, very frequently, especially due to the wellness, diet, fitness, all that culture of saying that there's, you know, inflammatory foods or bad foods or foods that we should avoid and kind of like, you know, categorizing things as good or bad, black or white thinking, that is a really huge trigger to a lot of people to avoid certain foods and even get conditioned to believe that these foods actually cause their symptoms when in reality, it's just our brain's way of making that connection and learning that. Overall, you guys, the biggest thing to help your nervous system in any single situation is to turn down the fear. This might be the fear of flying. This might be the fear of chemicals or food. This might be the fear of failure. This is a big one. A lot of perfectionists fear failure so much and they feel like if they're not perfect, that you know everything is a catastrophe and that may, is the lens at which you're viewing this life through. So I was, a, I still identify, I guess, as a recovering perfectionist and this was a huge reason that my nervous system was always really heightened. If I didn't do everything that I wanted to do perfectly, that felt incredibly unsafe to me, which was really scary. So by turning down the fear of what the situation is, being late with the kids, making a coach mad, making somebody else mad, not being perfect, eating certain things, you know, any of those things, being scared of not being able to sleep at night for those of you who have insomnia and you're trying to get this perfect bedtime routine down and you're checking your whoop band or your aura ring and really dialing into that, that turns up that fear that this is a really big deal and a huge problem. And so it creates more internal pressure and fear. So we ideally want to rewire your brain to teach you the world is safe. Your situations are safe. 
there's not a catastrophic thing happening numerous times a day. The things that you are worried about, that your brain somewhere got the idea that these are unsafe, are actually safe. You are going to be okay. You want to give yourself these messages of safety versus danger. And so what happens is these catastrophic thoughts are called cognitive distortions and can start to act real. You're like, your brain's like, well, what if this happens? And it's the worst case scenario. And we start to be, what if that does happen? Oh my gosh, that would be so awful. And we go down the rabbit hole. So when you're noticing that and you're having, you know, all or nothing thinking or catastrophization or any of these things, calling them out as what they are, they're trying to protect you. They're trying to keep you safe. If your brain catastrophizes flying because it thinks flying is so unsafe, it might get you to stay home. But the problem with that is once you buy into that, your world gets smaller and smaller and smaller and more and more things feel unsafe until you have a lot of anxiety, which is not what we want. We wanna start to challenge those fears even though they might feel uncomfortable. Sometimes our brain is not the most reliable thing. I know a lot of us feel like we need to trust our gut, which is definitely a thing, but we need to trust our gut, not necessarily our brain, because thoughts are just thoughts. We don't always have to believe them. And most of the time our thoughts are pretty much not accurate a lot of times. So I know for mine, a lot of my thoughts are more catastrophes and weird things and things that would never happen. So they can't be trusted, right? I get to decide myself, I get to take my power back and decide which ones of those I attach meaning to and which ones I just let go. And that's on me to decide that. So some other things that can be really soothing. I think that we have to look at our life in terms of like, how can we soothe ourselves? So obviously things like meditation, sitting in nature, all of those things are really, really helpful. Going on leisure walks, being in sunshine, calming down, deep breathing. Your brain has to know you're okay. So if you can do these things very calmly and breathe deeply, that also are those are also messages that everything's okay. I encourage my patients to drive slower, walk slower, breathe deeper, eat slower. Those are all messages that the world's not on fire. We don't need to hurry, hurry, hurry and be chaotic. We can actually slow down, deep breathe, be calm, and that will start to give the message to your nervous system that the world is safe. A lot of people get stuck when they're in this fight or flight and they're anxious or they're having the physical symptoms of trying to force their nervous system to calm down. So we start to say, okay, I just need to meditate for a minute and we sit there and we start to close our eyes and like deep breathe. But again, you're practicing this idea called outcome dependence, which is like, okay, I have to deep breathe and force my nervous system to calm down, but you're still giving yourself the message that this symptom that you're having, this deep or this panic or this anxiety or this hypervigilance, this fight or flight response is wrong. You want to give yourself the opposite message and teach yourself, okay, I'm anxious, I'm, my brain's really hypervigilant, it's detecting something in my environment, whether I know what it is or not, that is feeling unsafe. That's okay, that's what's happening, we're safe, we're okay. Giving yourself these messages, but also practicing this idea of outcome independence. That we can meditate, we can go sit in, in nature, we can go sit in the sun, we can do grounding, we can do any of these things, and it's okay if our nervous system is still heightened. We have to be okay at learning how to sit in that discomfort to let things come down. The more that we force ourselves to come down, that's going to create extra hypervigilance because your brain thinks that's a huge problem that's there. So you cannot force a nervous system to calm down. If you can start to do these other things and teach your brain that the world is safe and you're okay and things don't have to be perfect and it's okay if you don't please all the people and it's okay if you make a mistake and it's okay to fly and it's okay to eat some food sometimes and it's okay to do X, Y, Z, your nervous system will take care of itself. That is the last step of this. You can't start with teaching your nervous system to calm down or making it calm down. You're going to be climbing an uphill battle. You have to start teaching it and doing actions and you know, paying attention to your thoughts and buying into the right thoughts and then your nervous system will start to take care of itself.
I hope this was helpful. That is my take on the nervous system and all the things that I've learned over the last 15 years of you know, professional training, my own experience, working with patients, all of the things. I've really spent a large part of my life and career figuring this out because it was such a huge problem for me to start with in my whole symptoms with adrenal fatigue and chronic back pain and anxiety and all of those things. So I have a lot of different episodes on why I got adrenal fatigue symptoms, how I healed from my adrenal fatigue. So go check out those. I'll leave all of these videos in the description below. Um, but I think that you'll be really enlightened. And if you're feeling like you're in this place where you're just constantly in fight or flight, you're constantly hypervigilant, you're constantly, you know, freaking out, pull open that curtain. And what are you so scared of? What is the worst case that you're afraid of? And start working back there, teaching your brain that you're actually safe. That's my best advice to you. I help patients with this all the time. Therapist is great for this. People who focus on um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. If you have a big trauma in your life, even like EMDR therapy, there's a lot of help for you out here that we can, we can definitely get you feeling much better. I hope you found this helpful. If you have friends and family that could benefit from this video, please share this with them. I also have a free download called Six Evidence-Based Habits for Healthy Hormones that gives you six evidence-based habits, basically what I said, for healthier hormones, easy, easy things to fit in your day. And we do talk about this topic because it is one of the biggest topics of imbalanced hormones too, that other health professionals, other hormone experts are not talking about enough. Some people will say, you know, balance stress or reduce your stress, but it goes much, much deeper than that and how to do that. So this is uh, the beginning of it, I can go much deeper, but this is the beginning of how to teach your brain that you're safe to turn down that fear response to then turn down the stress response. So I hope you found this helpful. I'll be back next week with a brand new video.